The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling. Top of the day, I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Dedding. And this is Story by Story. Celebrating the human spirit. And we're storytellers, Kate and I. And we're going to have about an hour conversation with you and a wonderful guest storyteller about the art of storytelling, about how to use storytelling as a method of teaching and entertainment. Anything else we're going to try to do? Not tap dance today. Not nope. tap dance. And, and I'm not playing the kazoo. I decided that that was going to be off the, off the table. Right. Okay. Um, but I've had, a, I've had a wonderful month of traveling around and doing stuff. How about you? Well, I've had a, uh, yes, yeah, uh, not too much traveling, but first Elizabeth Ellis graced my home oh. once again for a weekend workshop. And tell our listeners her. Elizabeth Ellis is one of the finest storytellers in the country. She's been recognized by the National Storytelling Network uh, by two awards, uh, the Circle of Excellence Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm -hmm. And there are only two dozen or so people who have received yeah. that last award. So, and she's also a wonderful um, harvester of story or, or midwife. Midwife of, of story. That's a good line. That's a good line. Uh, so she did that and she did a, 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 con a house concert at my home. Oh, wonderful. So two things I want to share about her. One, in the workshop, she said that she wanted to share something that she learned from the singer-songwriter Tom Paxton years ago. She took a workshop with him, and he said, every day I wake up and say, I'm a singer-songwriter. What am I going to do as a singer-songwriter today? He said, some days... I have I, I am at home and I can work on no, new songs. Other days I'm traveling, so creating a new song is hard. But I could I could perfect lyrics mm -hmm. pretty much anywhere I am that I and so I have taken that to heart and go every day I am a storyteller and what am I going to do about, uh, to to that end. Today, that's a, that's a great thought, and, mm -hmm. and no matter what, who, why you, what you do, boy, oh boy, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've heard you. I just want you to know that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna start to do that because um, sometimes when you introduce yourself and they ask you, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You say you're a storyteller, they go, right. <laughs> and, uh, and I, so you tell a lot of lies, I, huh? I, I, yeah, yeah, right. Well, um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't top that. Although I did, have a, I did have a bucket list item happen for the third time. For the third time. You know, you're only I, supposed to dip into the bucket once, well, I think. If, if you get a bucket list going around more than once, that's, that's like a, just a big bucket. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know how I used to, I, I went through a phase where I was giving away red noses and yes. kazoos. In fact, I vacuumed up one from underneath a bed. It, 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 all of a sudden, the vacuum cleaner wasn't working so well, and I pulled out a dusty red well, nose. Well, I was just all over with these red noses. And, uh, so I, my wife acted on it with a surprise birthday party, and I got to lead a parade with a red nose and all my friends and noses and kazoos. And then we did a, a fundraiser for the Art Center in Schenectady, uh -huh, right? and that was, was part there. of a jazz band. And uh, Sandy Schumann gave them a saxophone, as I recall, in, in, in kind of in the appeal to that, which is another story. And then I had a great niece get married in Seattle. And um, about a month before that, my sister-in-law emailed me asking where I bought my red noses. <laughs> and I, so I sent it back to her. Why did I ask? She says, I'm getting ready for you. <laughs> and we got to Seattle, and she had 125 red noses and kazoos. And her son, my nephew, the bride's father, had very quietly nosed the Doolittle side of the church just after their vows were pronounced. And I thought it was one of the nicest things anybody <laughs> could ever do for me in the family. 
And uh, so at the end of all the celebrations of the cake cutting and all the other stuff at the wedding reception, they introduced me and I came up and my brother and his wife were on each side of me, one with a bag of noses, one with a bag of kazoos. I told the story, we gave out the kazoos, we did a whole conga line to I heard it from the grapevine and the party <laughs> went on an extra hour. So, you know, that's a bucket list item, like cubed. <laughs> We're, we're, we're sharing memories here, and I just want you to know that one of the things about storytelling is that in a way when you think about a story, if you're going to tell a story or write a story, you're really writing about a moment, a memory. We don't tell stories about days per se. There's always a crucible of a moment in there, and that's a, that's a little bit of a shared learning about the nature of things mm -hmm. and stories. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful guest here today. Maybe we ought to introduce him and, and bring him into the conversation. What do you think? I think it's time. I think it's time. Sandy Schumann is with us. And Sandy Schumann is one of the greatest friends of storytelling in upstate New York. Um, he's practiced his art uh, kind of semi-professionally as a facilitator and a consultant with the Rockefeller Institute. And he's done remarkably well in those interpersonal things. And he is a harvester of stories about interesting things and situations, many of which have to do with music. Sandy, we're so pleased to have you here. I'm pleased to be here. What a word, pleased. Pleased it's to be here. And, and one thing he did as a facilitator and as a storyteller, he had the idea that we could, the, the Story Circle Guild could produce a book of an anthology of our stories. And he took it from its, its this idea and he carried it through with what I thought was an over elaborate process, but turned out to be just what was needed. You mean feedback, when Feedback, um, I think four, level, four times you got feedback on your story. And I had one story that I thought was pretty good, but was even better by the time, you know, Marnie suggested that part and, you know, so it was it was a wonderful and it happened and it's available um, and so I wanted to publicly say thank you Sandy thank you Sandy for that and, and at first we did think you were going a little bit overboard when you brought in the professional editor but uh, that turned out to be one of the no, key elements no, of the whole it, book it's it's great. it's a quality yeah. book that I'm, I'm pleased to uh, give out to friends and sell to others hmm. <laughs> I, I, I even kind of give them away at uh, the right time when somebody asks mm -hmm. about storytelling. I, you know, mm -hmm. So there you go. But, Sandy, were you always a storyteller? <laughs> well, I could tell you a story. <laughs> and that's why I'm laughing, because I've heard that story. <laughs> uh, when, when I was a child, uh, bedtime, my father would tell me stories and they were not stories that he read out of some book they were stories that just came out of his head and they were mostly stories about him you know his life and and uh, it amazes me today that there were certain stories that i wanted to hear him tell over and over again about when he was a little boy anyway that would come to an end and it would be time for me to go to sleep and so i he would kiss me goodnight, and I'd have this image in my head of a, a grandfatherly figure with a big book open and a little boy sitting on his lap. And they were coming to the end of the page, and this story that they were reading was the story of me. It was the story of my day. Wow. And as my day was coming to a close, the little boy would climb off of the grandfatherly lap and close the big book and I would go to sleep and in the morning I had this idea that in the morning I would have this image of the little boy climbing up onto the grandfatherly lap and they would open the big book and begin the story of me I've, I've never managed to do that to wake up in the morning and conjure up that image I'm still working on it but I've taken to opening my storytelling shows, my performances, with that story. With opening and the book. Open, you know, this image. And then at the end, I say, when I go to bed tonight, I'll have that image in my head of the story of me, the grandfatherly lap and the book and the little boy. And, 
And I'll see in the story of me, all of you are in that book. And perhaps when you go to sleep, you'll have that image too. And you'll see me in your story and we'll be forever connected by our stories. That's a, that's a, that's a beautiful method, although some of the players have changed a little, haven't they? I mean, haven't you moved from the boy in the lap to the grandfather in the story? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to, I had, just yeah, had to do that. Just, right. Uh, I'm sticking with the little boy. Oh, you're sticking yeah, with the little boy, yeah. okay. He's in touch with his inner child. Right. Okay. Okay. As are you. <laughs> <laughs> when did you uh, begin to think about storytelling as something more than uh, a bedtime experience? Oh boy, you know, you've heard this story too, but um, far be it for me to not tell it again. Um, I was conducting a training program with a colleague in, of all places, the Pentagon. It was a three-day training program. And at the end of the training program, they had to fill out these evaluation forms. So I'm sitting there next to my co-trainer, and he's got this pile of evaluation forms. And on the back of the form, you know, it says, what was the best part of the workshop? And people write in an answer. And so he looks at these evaluation forms, hands them over to me, and I look at them and I see what was the best part of the workshop, and somebody wrote in, Sandy's stories. And I didn't know what they were talking about. I look at a couple more, see another one, another. What did you like best about work? Sandy told some really great stories. I'm getting puzzled. Another one comes by. The stories that Sandy told were right on target. And I looked over at my co-trainer and I said, Freeman, what are they talking about? And he looks at me puzzled and says, Sandy, don't you remember you told that story about the time they threw you out of the meeting? That You had that one about how, how the guy came in late and he was wearing a t-shirt and shorts and a hangover? And you had all these stories you told and I, I realized, yes, I did tell a lot of stories. It just came naturally. I, I wasn't aware of it. And then I became a storyteller. And there you go. But your father had always been telling you the stories of his life, and that's how you communicate in the Schumann family. That's exactly it. But not at the level of awareness of saying, oh, I tell stories. It was just... I can't, I can't, I, I have to de derail us for just a moment. Can you tell us what training course you were give, giving at the Pentagon? It was in group facilitation. Oh. Uh, Collaborative oh. problem solving and decision making. Okay. Wow. You notice how that just rolls off? Rolls yes. on Collaborative problem, <laughs> problem solving, solving and decision making. Yeah. Took a lot of practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're also a musician, and, and, and I must say that when I first met you, I met you as a storyteller, and then at one of your performances, you had the guitar with you, and you played so beautifully. I, I just, I mean, those two things kind of came along together, or how did the music kind of start? Um, when I was a kid, I, uh -huh. I liked to listen to talk radio, what there was of it okay. at the time. I was not big listening into, I did not listen to popular music or classical music. But the music that I did listen to was folk music. And what attracted me to folk music as opposed to these other forms was that folk singers, before they sing the song, they tell a story. It's typically a story that introduces the song. It puts the song in context. And I really like that. Again, not really thinking analytically about it. I just like that. But that's in large measure what attracted me to folk music. Mm -hmm. And why it is that orchestras and symphonies and why they don't tell the story is a great mystery to me. Although the, some of them do. The Colony Town Memorial Band and. does that. Ah, and I one of our this. faithful listeners, Bob, Bob Suss, Suss, is the one who comes up with the commentary ah. before each piece. And yes, it, it makes a huge difference. And I also saw, oh, I think it was um, Itzhak Perelman in a performance. And two-thirds of the way, he says nothing. And then 
the last third, he introduces each piece, and it was mm. like he was recognizing that we were there. It was it made such a huge difference. Yeah. You're right. They should all do it. And from our lips to your <laughs> ears, and please make it happen. Well, yes. I'm going to email David Allen Miller. I just want you to know, because he does a little bit of yes, that. Yes, he in, does. In, with his, the Albany Symphony, and, and, a, and it makes a big difference in in understanding both the the, the the music and the musicians, particularly if you pick out kind of the lead parts and certain things and he introduces those people. You're right. They should be doing more of that. Yeah, well, and I think in the Schenectady Symphony, they have a pre-show where they kind of do all that. And then you have mm -hmm. to sort of remember it. And, yeah. and, and but. Anyways, we have been talking. Oh, you have a new program or a new a, 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 a title that encompasses a number of stories, many more than you can tell in one hour. New York Tales, Tall and True. Each one is, is probably one or the other, or sometimes there's a mixture, maybe? Sometimes. I, I would say often. <laughs> often. Often. Isn't that a lovely Yeah, the, the, the subtitle there is uh, some of New York's... Uh, uh, is it there? I can't remember. You know, you'd think I would. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it, it's there it is. Read some that. of New York State's folklore is truly unbelievable. Some of its history is even more so. Oh. There you go. There you go. Do, yeah. do you have one of those stories I, here? Or you funny you, you should ask. Oh. <laughs> yeah. As we a matter of fact, this. I do. What a segue. What yeah. a segue. Yeah. It really is. Um, so I would I would tell you a story that I like to call the curse of Mamie O'Rourke, and uh, we'll start off with a song. Good. With or without kazoo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's where Johnny Casey, little Jimmy Crow, Jakey Krause the baker, who always had the dough. Boys and girls together, we would sing and waltz while Tony played the organ on the sidewalks of New York. East side, west side, all around the town. The tots sing ring a rosy, London bridge is falling down. Boys and girls together, me and Mamie O'Rourke, trip the light fantastic on the sidewalks of New York. Well, that song, written in 1894, came about when uh, Charles Lawler, who was a, a small-time vaudeville performer, a singer, he's coming home from a performance, walking, and uh, he's thinking, you know, I'm singing other people's songs. They get the credit. They have to get paid. You know, I should write my own songs. He'd never written a song before, but as he continues to walk, this, this tune comes into his head. And he, he continues to walk and work on this tune. And then he, he goes to his friend's place of work. His friend, James Blake, works at a haberdashery. And he hums this song for him. And Blake likes it, and he, he gets Lawler to repeat it over and over again. And finally, he says, I got it, I got it. You go write the music down, and I'll work on the lyrics. And Blake puts these lyrics together. Lawler comes back. He's got the music written down. 1894, it's a big hit. People are singing this all over. Time goes on. It, it's no longer very popular, but then Al Smith runs for President of the United States, Al Smith, governor, governor. four-term governor of the state of New York, uh, a, a reformer working on efficiency in government, consolidated 
New York government from hundreds of separate agencies and commissioners to a manageable number increased the centrality, the power of the, the governor, not just in New York, but this led to reforms in other states as well. That was his theme song. One could say that it lost him the election in 1928. Uh, he carried eight states. Herbert Hoover got the remaining 40. He used it as his theme song again in 1932 when he sought the Democratic nomination again, which he lost to FDR. FDR had a better theme song. Happy Days Are Here Again. Yeah. Uh, Jack Yellen and Milton Adger. Anyway, the song has become more and less prominent over the years, but for decades it was the theme song at Belmont Raceway. And the Belmont Stakes, the third race of the Triple Crown, drew the biggest crowd, and that was the song that they heard all these horse racing fans. Well, attendance at the racetrack began to fall off. And so the, the management, among other measures, decided, you know, we should update the song. This is an old song. This is 1894. It doesn't speak to our current clientele. This is, you know, the 80s and 90s long time after the song was popular. And so they changed the song to New York, New York. Do, 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 do. Thank you for, for that little uh, musical rendition. Well, that seemed like a good idea, except that since 1978, when Affirmed won the Triple Crown, the Triple Crown, this is the Kentucky Derby, followed a couple of weeks later by the Preakness, followed by a couple of weeks later the Belmont Stakes. And to win the Triple Crown, the horse has to be first in each of those three races. Well, there were a lot of horses that came in first in the Derby and then came in first in the Preakness and did not come in first at Belmont. And uh, horse race fans were justifiably upset. Prior to that, every few years, there would be a Triple Crown winner. 37 years go by. It's not until 2015 that American Pharaoh wins the Triple Crown. Now, if you were to Google the curse of Mamie O'Rourke, you would find that the fans concluded that the reason why no horse was winning the Triple Count was because Mamie O'Rourke wouldn't let them. Because Belmont stopped playing the song. And the only way to get the Triple Crown back was to reinstate the song. Well, the, the managers of Belmont Raceway did that. They put the song back, not as the main theme song, but they kind of snuck it in, hidden, didn't work. Until 2015, American Pharaoh won the Triple Crown. But the horse racing pundits have not been able to solve the mystery. Why was the curse lifted? There's nothing that makes any sense. So I did some research. I, I, I hesitate to admit how much time I spent <laughs> looking at this. I'm, I'm looking at the trainers, the owners, the jockeys, all sorts of, you know, what, what could possibly explain how the curse was lifted? I'm not finding any pattern. And then I had an idea. In that song, we have, of course, Mamie O'Rourke, there's Johnny Casey, uh, little Jimmy Crow, pretty Nellie Shannon. These are all Irish names. And so um, I'm trying to find an Irish connection. And I, I noticed in my searches this newspaper article, New York Times, 
prior to the Belmont, after American Pharaoh had won the Derby and the Preakness, but prior to the Belmont, his owner sold the breeding rights to Coolmore Farms, a stud farm headquartered in Ireland. So the progeny of American Pharaoh would be Irish in that sense. Well, if that was true, well, what about all the other horses, the other 11 horses, the near misses, that didn't win the Triple Crown? Well, I looked at their retirement homes, and they're all out there in stud farms somewhere in, uh, in the United States, American-owned farms, Japan, Chile. None of them are on Irish farms except for American Pharaoh. So that's my explanation, that Mamie O'Rourke lifted the curse because American Pharaoh would be breeding for the Irish. And so with that uh, puzzle solved, we can now sing the entire song, or at least the verses I didn't get already. Uh, down in front of Casey's old brown wooden stoop, on a summer's evening we formed a merry troop boys and girls together we would sing and waltz while tony played the organ on the sidewalks of new york that's where johnny casey little jimmy crow Jakey Krause, the baker's son, who always had the dough. Pretty Nellie Shannon, with a dude as light as a cork. She first picked up the wall step on the sidewalks of New York. So things have changed since those times, some are up in G. Others, they are on the hog, but they all feel just like me. They'd give up all they've got if they could once more walk with their best girl and have a twirl on the sidewalks of New York. East side, west side, all around the town. The tots sing ring a rosy. London Bridge is falling down. Boys and girls together, we would sing and waltz while Tony played the organ on the sidewalks of New York. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I'll give you a real clap. So you solved the mystery. I, I believe so. I think I found the reason why Mamie O'Rourke lifted the curse, thankfully. Thank you, Mamie. So I, I do not keep up with the horses. What happened in 2016, 17, and 18? Any Triple Crown winner? Well, we just had another one, I think. Yeah. Justify? Justify. Justify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. okay. So the curse would appear to be lifted. Uh, um, the, the, the horse racing pundits are still struggling, but... Um, <laughs> have you contacted Belmont? <laughs> I can't say as I have. <laughs> well, you know, you know that the, the New York Racing Association, which runs these racetracks, you know, should be informed about the error that they, you know, that they committed, and, and perhaps we could start a little appeal to bring back the song. For oh, there, there were many. Oh. Um, uh, the, the really, uh, the, the fans were vociferous, and that's why they, they reintroduced the sidewalks of New York, but you know, played by the bugler or something, not, not the main song. And um, so the curse theory uh, took further root. I, w yeah. I would think that we could get them to bring it back just for the draw value of the story of the curse. Uh, one would hope. One would hope. Right. I think you should tell the story there. Yeah. 
Right. Okay. Like Belmont. You set that up for me. I'll, <laughs> All right. I'll no, no, put no, that no, in no. the production company. Tell, tell your manager. <laughs> tell your right. manager. Yeah. Right. I'll tell my manager to do it. Good idea. Yeah. Um, oh. There's a, there's another somewhat interesting footnote to the to the song, 1894. So it has this line. Um, some are up in G. Things have changed since those times. Some are up in G. Well, what does that mean? Well, the linguist societies of America uh, and various blogs and websites have researched this extensively, trying to find other instances from, from that era uh -huh. or earlier yeah. where that phrase is used, and many theories about what that means. Um, in a nutshell, it means something good. You know, up in G, one theory is that it's a musical illusion. Uh, G is the letter of the highest note in the scale, A, B, C, D, F, G, and then you start with A again. Um, it, uh, it could stand for Gramercy Park, you know, private park in Manhattan where you have to be a little well-heeled in order to live there. Uh, so mostly allusions to things being uh, well off. A couple of theories otherwise, one is that it's a reference to the, the subway, the G line, but the G line wasn't built in 1894, uh, so that, that theory goes away. Another is that it's a reference to jail, J-A-O-L, you know, some old uh -huh. English spelling of jail, which would be a reference to Sing Sing, you know, mm -hmm. being up in jail. That one doesn't get a lot of merit. And the other phrase is, uh, others they are on the hog. Others they are on the hog, but they all feel just like me. And uh, hog is a reference to the engine of uh, a train. And, um, you know, the head hog is the head engineer. Okay. So it's it apparently, from what I can tell from the slang dictionary of America, uh, still the, the engine may still be referred to as a hog. but. Um, on the hog means you're riding the rails, you're a tramp, you're not doing so well. Oh, oh wow. And you're a bum. So some are up in G, others they are on the hog, but they all feel just like me. Good nostalgia song, eh? Hey, it's a, mm -hmm. and a, and a nice, solid bit of research, Sandy. I think that's really good. I mean, it was a pleasure to listen to it. Oh. Yeah. We'll be back uh, with Sandy, and uh, right now Kate's going to kind of tell us what's going on in storytelling uh, in the month of November, the month of Thanksgiving. Yes, and it starts on the first Tuesday of the month at Tuesday Tales and Stuff at Arthur's Market and Historic Coffee House in the Stockade section of Schenectady on November 6th, Stories of Gratitude. And it's an open mic for storytelling, music, and spoken word. Hmm. So come on down, enjoy the food, the atmosphere, and good times shared by all. Then we have on that Friday, which is now the second Friday of the month, uh, Shawnakee Evenings happen at the Irish American Heritage Museum on Broadway in Albany, across from the Delaware Hudson, old Delaware Hudson. Well, it's now SUNY Plaza. SUNY That's Plaza. Right. Stories of Remembrance and Thanksgiving with Marnie Gillard and Nancy Marie Payne, who have been on this show. And they are both tremendous storytellers. Actually, we only have tremendous storytellers. We, on do, this we show. only have tremendous We don't ask, we don't invite the media over. And we have tremendous hosts, too, don't Oh. Like <laughs> mm. uh, okay, yeah. moving right along. Then the Interfaith Story Circle, which is uh, another wonderful group in the area, is having their monthly meeting on Thursday, November 13th at 7 o'clock, Wisdom Tales for Life's Journey with Tellers from Story Circle, Frankly Speaking, that's Frank Wind and D. Lee Wind, at Channing Hall First Unitarian Universalist Society of Albany, on Washington Avenue. Didn't think I could get through all of that. Um, and that's a great place to listen to a story. And right, and so you can come and listen, and I should spell wisdom with an M, not an N. Uh, <laughs> Proofreading on the set. Yes, yeah. yes, the slides get added afterwards. Um, so we highly recommend that, but a 
highlight of the year, we like to think, yes. is Telebration. It'll be our 23rd annual Telebration at the GE Theater in Proctor's and Schenectady on Sunday, November 18th at 3.30 p.m. And our topic is Sparks. Sparks. So sparks will fly? Sparks will fly. And Ooh. our storytellers will be... Joe Doolittle, Kate Dudding, Eileen Egan Mack, Elliot Nieves, Claire Nolan, Barbara Palumbo, Nancy Marie Payne, Karen Pillsworth, and Sandy, Sandy Schumann. So that's a that's gonna be a great, great lineup, and it's in the afternoon on Sunday. November eighteenth at three thirty PM. The refreshments at intermission are fabulous. Right. Worth coming just for the refreshments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But the stories even more so. And Sparks, that, that title has sparked uh, different responses from different people. There will be some personal stories, some literary, new literary stories, so um, fictional stories that our, our t tellers have come up with. Uh, Nor Smith. Mm -hmm. And they're usually grim, even though the Grimm brothers had nothing to do with them. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of wonderful stuff. Stuff, that's a horrible word for a storyteller to say. But it's a good... Fabulous uh, tales. Stuff there. fits right in November, you know. You put it in the turkey. So it's oh, stuffing. stuffing. That's what I was... Th no, I wasn't. No, no. Thank, good thing. Thanks, good thing. thanks for the save. Almost save. Almost, Almost save. save. Yeah. And then we have our monthly meeting of the Story Circle of the Capital District on Tuesday, November 20th, right here at Colony Town Library, 6 to 8 p.m. Follow the signs to figure out how you enter the building and where we're going to be. Um, it's under reconstruction. It'll be a great building once it's done, but in the me meantime, we've, we're being flexible. Our beloved library is being updated. Yes, yes. and, and uh, we love being here. And then to finalize the month is the storytelling open mic at Cafe Lena. Now every fourth Tuesday of the month, except for December because that's Christmas. And the featured teller on November 27th will be our very own Siri Allison. Siri Allison. And that is uh, an open mic for storytelling only, and they're, they're very strict, no notes. You might get by with a few things written on your hands if you're, but other than that, but they're very attentive too. So I think, you know, that's that. I, I actually I didn't recommend that. No, no, no. Um, but they very much encourage you a first telling of a story, a story that's um, isn't polished. That this is you know, sometimes you need a live audience, and that you can do at our guild meetings also. But at the guild meetings, you, you can get as much or as little feedback as you want. Which is a good thing. Yes, Sandy has improved is, any number uh, of my stories, as has Joe. Um, you know, they're, they're keen listeners, and they go, well, that spot, that little spot there, it was a little vague, fuzzy, confusing, whatever. And Cafe Lena is about two years from its renovation, which yes. was spectacular. So if you haven't been up to the new Cafe Lena, you should visit sometime on one of our open mics. It's yes. a great experience. It's the old lady's gotten a facelift. You can still recognize her, but the acoustics um, have been vastly improved. Uh, the food has gone up. Um, and that's all available when you come to the open mic for a modest fee. Then just a, a slide to remind you of our 12th season at Proctor's. It includes word plays, which is very much like Telebration, except uh, they're held in the, on the lower level of Proctor's, underneath the box office. So sometimes it's known as the underground. Sometimes it's called the Hearst Education Center. Mm. Might even have a third name. But it's just, you go down the stairs in the box office, and, and there, there will be. Uh, so we have, after, in, uh, after celebration that we've just mentioned, we'll have three more uh, word plays in the underground uh, in January through April 7th. I'm looking forward, uh, all of them, starting over 
Inside Out, I don't know what people are going to come up with for Inside Out. But Siri, Joe, and I, Siri produces uh, Word Plays up in Salem. We, we, somebody came up with a bunch, and then others said, well, these are my favorite, and so we all sort of chimed in on it. Inside Out and Shenanigans. That's after both St. Patrick's Day on March 17th and April Fool's Day on April 1st. I, so Shenanigans is on April 7th. I'm looking forward to that. Yes. I really am. So, and if you can't make it out to any of our uh, events or if you're dying to hear a story someday, we're available on demand on YouTube. And not to come to your home, no. Though that could be That's arranged right. for a fee. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> StoryCircle at Proctors.org and click on YouTube for over 200 stories, many recorded right here in this studio. So, that's the end of the coming attractions. Wow, that's a pretty full month. Yes, indeed. That's great. Something to be thankful for. I think we ought to go back and see if Sandy has another story. I bet he does. Do you have another story? Funny you should ask. Again, twice in one hour. Um, the legacy, the McPherson legacy to the city of Albany. Um, there is not much that I can tell you about John and Mary McPherson. They came to this country with their parents uh, when they were children in the uh, early part of the 1800s. Their father got a job as a janitor working for uh, the state of New York, a job that his son John took over. And uh, neither John nor Mary ever married. They spent their, the rest of their lives in Albany. When their parents died, they inherited whatever they had saved. And when John died, Mary inherited everything he had saved. And as uh, her years were getting on, she was approached by members of the St. Andrew's Society, the Scottish Support Association. Uh, apparently there had been a long-standing desire on the part of the Scots community, the Caledonian Club, the St. Andrew's Society, to honor the plowman bard, the, the poet of Scotland, Robert Burns, with a statue a monument. Resolutions had been passed adopting this idea, but the money was very slow in accumulating. They approached Mary McPherson to see if she would be willing to direct the remains of her estate to that purpose. It turned out that the savings of the family that had accumulated amounted to thirty or forty thousand dollars. This is, you know, 1880 money. Mm -hmm. Forty thousand dollars today would be roughly equivalent to a million dollars. They were successful in gaining Mary's agreement and in her will she specified that such a statue honoring Robert Burns be created. Peter Kinnear, who was a, uh, uh, owned a foundry, a businessman, um, actually invested in and then became the manufacturer of the first plastic. Uh, the plastic was invented by John Wesley Hyatt, and uh, they made billiard balls, where billiard balls had been made of ivory from elephants, you know, causing the destruction of the elephant population, and also causing an imperfectly balanced sphere. Uh, so their plastic celluloid billiard ball was a superior product and half the price. So they were doing pretty well financially. But he was able to uh, convince Mary McPherson of this effort and he became the executor and thereby had the job of actually seeing through the creation of this monument. And 
interviewing various uh, sculptors. They finally decided on a sculptor who originally came from Albany by coincidence. And everyone approved this was the, the finest monument ever to Robert Burns. And mind you, there are many, many monuments to Robert Burns. And so you can see it in Albany, in Washington Park. I would recommend that you go there. You'll see the statue, Robert Burns sitting with a book in hand. And along the footing of the statue, you'll see various quotes from his poems and songs. And on the pedestal, the, the, the granite pedestal, on each side is a scene from one of his songs or poems, including one from Old Lang Syne, picturing a couple of guys sitting at a table with mugs in their hands. But I'd like to ask you further, as you remember Robert Burns, to look at the back side of the monument, the back side of the stone pedestal. A few inches above the ground, engraved in the stone, you will see the words, McPherson Legacy to the City of Albany, 1888. And so you might remember Robert Burns and his literary contributions, and you might also remember the McPherson family, John and Mary and their parents. And so in their honor, as well as in honor of Robert Burns, we should sing his best known work. It, uh, it gets sung a lot, I think, at least once a year on New Year's Eve. Uh, for old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old Lang Syne. We too have run about the hills and picked the daisies fine. But we've wandered many a weary foot since old Lang Syne. For old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old Lang Syne. We too have paddled in the stream and from morning sun till dine. But seas between us broad have roared since old Lang Syne. Here's a hand, my trusty friend, and give us a hand of thine. We'll drink a cup of goodwill and old Lang Syne. For old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old Lang Syne. For long, old Lang Syne, old long since. Long Thank you. In a I literal was... sense, but uh, you, for, uh, idiomatically, it would be, you know, for days gone by uh -huh. or for old time's sake. Mm -hmm. oh. So, how did you trip across? Well, uh, uh, okay, so I was in the Albany Public Library decades ago. And um, I can't really put this politely. I, I had to use the men's room. And I thought I would uh, take something in the men's room to read. Mm -hmm. And so on my way to the men's room, I just picked something off the shelf. 
And that something turned out to be the historical sketch of the Burns statue from 1888. And so I'm reading about this statue and how it was created and it's as fortuitous as that or serendipitous <laughs> as that, really. Sometimes you find the story and sometimes the story <laughs> finds you. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I, was, I thought he was going to say he was with one of his kids playing in the park and noticed the, the affirmation yeah, at the yeah. statue. That would face. be a better, a better story. But well, that would uh, be a tall be true. one, though. <laughs> right, right. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, I've, I've looked at this inscription at the base of the pedestal. Unless you're looking for it, you won't notice it. Uh, it is the same color as the stone. It's engraved, but it's it's low down. I mean, uh, it's not at eye height. Well it's uh, right. It's not light. I mean, it's in shadow. You don't see a difference in the light between the stone and the engraved letters. I've tried to photograph it. Yeah. You look at the photograph. There's nothing there. Yeah. It's, it's really nondescript, obscure. Maybe on a cloudy day. With a bright flash. light shown at an angle. I've thought about how, how can you photograph this so it would actually show up. Um, if, if people are interested in, in learning more about Sandy Schumann as a storyteller, do you have a, a, a web page or anything like that? Okay, for the third time, I'm going to say, funny you should ask. Okay. Um, www.tothestory.com to the story.com yeah which is from a quote that uh, my father used to say there is always another side to the story it's also uh, another side. Right. so another side to the story.com was already taken ah. so, uh, so you just to the story side. to the story right wow. okay now We've got a, just a minute. No, we have we have about seven minutes. <laughs> oh, seven minutes. Well, this could be good. Uh, one of the do more delightful things that you've done, in my opinion, is uh, Adirondack Bendel's <laughs> roof. Off roof. And you know that was that was the t that's the title that, of the book. That's the title of a book, and and, and it's masterful. Uh, I I was traveling in the West, and I have a friend who was. Um, well, I have a friend, and I was looking for something to bring to Bob. Um, and he has an interesting Jewish background. So I brought him, Alex, I brought him your book. And um, I got this wonderful email about how much he was enjoying it. So it's, it's infectious. And that must have bubbled up from someplace that wasn't a men's room. Oh, well, <laughs> who knows? Um, <laughs> well, the, 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 the other title for the book is Welcome to Helm's Pond. Welcome to Helm's Pond. Uh, which is difficult enough to say, but it's easier than Adirondack Mendel's Ufruf. So you get full credit for, for mastering uh, Adirondack Mendel's Ufruf. Uh, the, the Helm story uh, actually originates from a, a German collection of stories, and they're stories about people who are fools. Uh, they, they do ridiculous things. They go to great extent to correct a simple error. And uh, I used to like those stories as a kid. Uh, the Helm stories really just put it in a Jewish context, and and that's these these are old books They're from the 1800s, might even be older than that. Anyhow, the Helm story as a type has been milked a lot, and and yet they all seem to take place in the 1800s. You know, the the villagers try to capture the moon in a wooden barrel. The, uh, the, the villager goes to paradise on a horse-drawn cart. Uh, the, the teachers are locked in an iron chest. And so the, you know, these are all images of a long time ago. And so I just wondered, you know, what happened to these people? And then uh, given my New York bias, I figured it must be they moved to New York somewhere. And so I started searching around for Helm in New York 
nothing. Uh, there is That's another. C H E L N. Right, right. Yeah, since we don't have a H sound in English, it's usually C H or K H. So I'm searching for both, find nothing. And then I, I thought, well, maybe it's an anglicized spelling, H E L M S. And behold, there's a Helms Pond in the Adirondacks. Uh, named after David Helm, who was a forester, a conservation officer. And so I took so that. So they say. So, so they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for covering for me. And so uh, that became the, the tract of land that the Helmites purchased okay. and made the move. And hard for. Right, right. And they searched long and hard for. And uh, it's where every acre is two acres. You can till the soil with a teaspoon, and there are not only four seasons, there are five. You know, summer, fall, winter, spring, black fly season. Um, so that, that provided the, the geographic uh, context for these stories, and m most of the stories are old stories, jokes that I have imported into that Helm context, which is the storytelling process, the, the folklore process. You take an idea from here and an idea from there and you smush mm -hmm. them together and before you know it, you've stolen a lot mm -hmm. of ideas and mm -hmm. retold them. Do you have moose turd pie in that? I can't remember. No, no. Because no, that, that I've seen in various Right. No, uh, lumbering camps. Yeah. Right. Section. Well, I, I have taken yeah. uh, Adirondack tall tale mm -hmm. type stories and Helm stories and mm -hmm. sort of mashed them together. Uh, Maybe moose pie isn't kosher. No. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Don't go there. Don't go there. We've already been in the men's room. Right. That's true. That's right. true. Yeah, right. I, I have thought um, uh, that, you know, one of the items on the, the menu at the broiled beet, the, the broiled local beet. eatery, would be the gefilte fish and peanut butter sandwich. But my, my wife did not approve. I mean, there's some other pretty awful things on that menu, but... <laughs> Gefilte fish and peanut butter. Right, the gefilte fish and peanut butter sandwich has not made it on the menu yet. The broiled beet diner. Uh, yes. What's the name of the waitress in the broiled beet diner? Bloomy. 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 The, all the names in the book are people in my family. Bloomy oh. is my sister, the, the crazy oboist who lives out in San Francisco, and, and, and so on. I, I didn't want to defame other people's names, I figured I'd keep it in the family. So Bloomy is a nickname or? It's my my sister's uh, Yiddish name. Oh, okay. Yiddish. Yeah. So, you know, typically, like, my, my Yiddish name is uh, Sender, uh, mm -hmm. Hebrew name, which is f taken from Alexander the Great. I'm named after Alexander the Great. That's another story. Yeah. Wow. He was Jewish? Uh, okay. We have <laughs> oh, we, we, <laughs> oh, sorry. We, we, we have less than a minute now, so okay. we have to start saying goodbye. Well, Sandy, I am so touched and pleased that you've been with us today. It's been just wonderful. And Kate, yeah. you've had, a, you've had a, a great run with all the things that are going on, and we appreciate your being the organizer of all this, because without you, we would just be lost. Sort of a ringmaster. Ringmaster. Ring ring uh, One to rule them all. <laughs> well, to take... Anyways. Uh, and we want to thank you all for joining us, and that you, we hope you'll join us at a live performance, or if not, back here on your cable network. Or online at Story Circle at Proctor's YouTube. Goodbye. Au revoir. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round 